Dr. Berman's there. Hello, Dr. Berman. Hello. Dan, Donna Hollander's there. Harvey Left from hey. Florida. Look at all these guys. Marshall from Philly. Wait, let me just do a quick see what Ralph Stern my, from the Canyon parents. Country Club. Yeah, hello. Hey. Oh, the Becks from Israel. There they from are. Israel. Hi, Mom, Dad. <laughs> Uh, uh, Lou Shook from Florida, Mike Gazin, premier lawyer from Newport Beach. I'm running out of space here. Okay, so <laughs> here we go. Let me go back to the first page here. I want to thank everybody for showing up. This is officially uh, the largest Zoom conference we've now had of all the Zoom conferences. Uh, I don't want to make Leticia too nervous, but uh, yeah, she's <laughs> She's Thank you, everyone, more, for joining. <laughs> generated more interest than everybody else, so that's great. Um, little background on me. I was uh, alerted by some Maccabi people probably five years ago. I, I'm assuming those people were Bob Spivak and Harvey Leff to uh, check out the new Israeli golfer who won the uh, Maccabiah Games. She's Jewish. She's playing in San Diego and <laughs> on the LPGA, so my wife and I traips down to San Diego. We, uh, we scouted her out. We stalked her, I think, if you were to ask her. Uh, wound up having dinner that night. And uh, ever since then, I've become, my wife and I have become friendly. Both uh, we're sparring partners. I get a stroke a hole. We're, uh, we work out crazy together. I won't go into those details in terms of who wins what contests. Uh, she's spent some time at our house with my wife and kids. Uh, I make occasional travel arrangements and answer an occasional legal question that yeah. I, I usually have to bluff. Anyway, against that backdrop, um, and we met like and we met five years ago. Right. What I can tell you is, of all the golf professionals I know, and I, I know a fair amount, um, without exception, I am told that Leticia has the best swing any of them have ever seen. I say that <laughs> knowing she's going to blush, and just to prove it, to start this discussion out. I'm going to play for you a little Instagram posting that Leticia made of uh, her driving 50 balls. I'm not going to play all 50, but I'm going to have uh, Steve play the first 10 or 12, and you'll see what I mean. And do not try this at home. Yeah, don't try this at home. Yeah, unless you want to exercise. Well, well this one was actually a golf drill um, to uh, learn to uh, become more loose and just let you know, the club do the work. After 30 shots, you you get tired. So, um, yeah. That's, uh, so I don't know if the sound, I'm not getting the sound on mine, but the sound, everyone is solid as can be. Um, yeah. and I've tried that drill. I've made it, I think through three balls and I heard too much and nothing was straight. So <laughs> yeah. So some people do it with three, five balls and just hit one after the next, after the next. And by, by, by the third, fourth, fifth ball, you just, you're not thinking about the swing, which is nice. So against that backdrop, we're going to start the discussion. And uh, I basically have put together a kind of a chronological list of uh, her activities. Um, first burning question everybody has. Yes, she's Jewish. She's not Jewish. She's Jewish. Uh, Where's my Belgium. star here? <laughs> there it is. Born in Belgium, emigrated to Israel at an early age. And Leticia, if you, if you feel comfortable doing so, <clears throat> give us a little bit of background into... Um, you're being born in Belgium, you're, maybe something about your grandparents, the fact you guys emigrated at what age, and then we'll pick up uh, with golf after that. Yeah, so born in Belgium, um, my entire family are, well, my parents were born in Belgium too. Grandparents, uh, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Belgium. Um, I think the first time I went, uh, I went to Israel, I think I was six weeks old. So since I was a baby, um, we used to go to Israel. Um, a few times a year for the holidays. My mom was a Hebrew teacher. I went to Jewish school. So um, we spoke French at home uh, and at school. We also learned Hebrew and Dutch. So um, we are very like passionate about Israel. And um, yeah, uh, grandparents, Holocaust survivors. On both, um, both sides, is that correct? Yeah, my mom's both um, Auschwitz concentration camp and then my father were hiding um, in Belgium. So. Yeah, very, uh, Judaism is a very important part in our life. So you moved to Kasaria at age six, oh, as I recall? Six, yeah. Actually, uh, my oldest sister is 14 years older than me. So when she graduated high school, she moved to, she made Aliyah by herself. We stayed in Belgium for one more year. 
and then we went uh, I moved when we we started Kita Aleph in Israel and then my brother he's 11 years older than me so he stayed in Belgium for one year, more year and then made the uh, made Aliyah after we did. And I will say that now, so my entire family is from Belgium, now about 98% of my family, they moved, uh, they moved to Israel. So everyone is now in Israel. Okay, and now the family moved to Caesarea? Uh, yeah, right away we moved to Caesarea and they uh, straight, uh, my parents started golf, I would say late, maybe a, if, I, if I'm right, around the age of like 40, 30 something. Um, so for those that haven't been to Israel or that have been there but haven't been in that area, describe generally that area, which I kind of fashion like almost Palm Springs, Palm Desert area, or Napa Valley, uh, except there's one golf course, not many golf courses. Yeah, so it's on a city. It's, uh, we have homes in Caesarea. It's spacious. Um, we have the beach, the golf course. So it's a, a very small town. We were about 5,000 people when we, when we moved. Now it's getting bigger, more crowded. but. Um, it's very different than, you know, Tel Aviv and, um, you know, the places there. You know. So when you moved there, you were initially concentrating on tennis. Is that right? So I was always very athletic as a kid. Um, so I think I would play any sport that was possible. <laughs> so when we moved to Caesarea, yes, I mainly played tennis and soccer at school every day. I, I just, I, I just wanted to be active. Um, and I, also, because of my parents, they belong to the golf course. Um, I was, you know, I joined the like a t group lessons there twice, about about twice a week. So I ended up being, you know, every day having something to do: either tennis, golf, soccer. Um, it was fun. And how many courses at that time and currently are there in Israel? Golf courses. So we had two golf clubs. Um, Cesarea has eighteen holes, and and Gash, which is. Um, just north of Tel Aviv, um, they had nine holes, but they made an 18 hole out of it, different tee boxes and sometimes different greens. Um, right now, unfortunately, they had to close that nine hole golf course. So we only have the course in Caesarea. But for years, I've been trying to um, open golf courses. So I'm waiting for <laughs> the day to come. And for those that haven't played the course there, how would you characterize it in terms of, say, California courses or... So it was very different. Um, it, it changed about 10 years, maybe a little bit more. Um, the city, they uh, kind of they wanted to build a more like American golf course with homes uh, on the golf course. Um, so they got P. Dye to redesign the golf course. So they took down the course completely. Um, before that, every hole, like you couldn't see the other holes because we had trees and bushes, you know, all around to the right to the left. Um, now it's more open, so it's like almost a typical Kidai golf course with elevated greens. Um, we don't have rough so much, we have sand, so that's like the difference. Um, and at what point do you become a serious golfer? How old are you? So yeah, so I was playing twice a week. I was concentrated more on tennis, but nobody in my family played tennis. It was hard to play more because I just played whenever we had I had lessons. Um, golf was easier to just you know go and play by myself. Um, I was always the, the, not the only girl, there was always like another girl that was also playing, but it used to like switch. She would play for a few years and then someone else would come. So I was pretty much the only girl um, and I was playing with boys my age, a little younger. Um, when I was 12, I was, I was a decent player. Um, I played junior events and when I was 12, I played in my first Israeli Open for club championship, which is the same because we have one golf course. So it's basically um, the club champion at the golf course. What? Basically the club champ at the golf course. The I mean, it, the Israeli Open is it whoever is the best player at that at, yeah. at the golf yeah. course. Okay. Yeah. And and I ended up winning in the playoff. I, so I was 12 years old and I won, which was a surprise because we were not expecting it. And it was like, that was the moment when I had to decide, okay, what sport am I going to pick and concentrate on? Because I knew I wanted to be a professional athlete. Um, and, and I think realizing that I was also good at golf and that I could practice alone and kind of really concentrate on it and maybe have a future. Um, I decided to just um, concentrate, you know, practice more than twice a week. So I dropped golf at uh, tennis. And then I, that was like the moment when I was like, okay, I'm going to concentrate on golf. Do you have any recollection when you won that tournament at 12, what you shot? 
Yes, yeah, so I'm not not very proud of it, but I was oh. pretty nervous. Wrong question. Uh, I, no, no, like you forget I was 12 and I was like nervous playing with ladies. I shot 94, 95, 80. And when I shot the 80, a lady gave me a stroke penalty. I still remember the hole. I still remember, you know, um, she gave me a stroke penalty because I got set up to the ball and then the ball moved a little bit. And this lady was like, you know, 50 and I'm 12. And she's like, yes, that's a stroke penalty. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I guess, you know, from that score of 80, it's, you know, I was shooting around low 80s or mid 80s um, when I was 12. Then when I concentrated just on golf, a year later, I would shoot under par. So that's really? how fast it went from being okay to and shooting were, under par. Was there a particular pro at the club that you worked with? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It okay. And so then do you play in that Israeli Open each successive year? So, yeah, it was, uh, Israeli Open, club championship, Israeli, so I will like, win by 30 shots eventually, like when I was 13, 13 and a half. So for three is this, years. Is that men two, and women or is it divided? Uh, no, so it's only women. Well, what I played then when I was 14, because I was beating them by 30 shots, I decided to play with the men, which I didn't do well. I mean, I was 14 or even maybe 13 and a half, maybe. Um, I didn't win, but that was like, I we I knew that you know I needed to stay competitive and playing and winning by thirty wasn't going to you know. And help. At, at some point you compete in the Maccabee Games for Israel, right? Yeah. So when I was thirteen, it was the first time I competed uh, in the Maccabee Games. Um, I still remember um, the um, opening ceremony. That was very emotional for me. When people ask me about the Olympics, which we will talk about it later, but how it was walking. <laughs> I don't know. It's to me, it's crazy. I, I, I say this for me when I was 13 and seeing all the flags in Israel was more powerful than walking in Brazil. So um, I think it also has to do with me being also from Belgium and just seeing like all the like Jewish people getting together and enjoying, you know. The how, how did you do in the first Maccabee games? Uh, not great. <laughs> I think I finished. I didn't finish top three, that's for sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and a girl did, from a girl from South Africa wanted I'm actually she plays on the European tour now that I see her once in a while. And you can continue then to play tournaments in Israel until you were So when I was I was I will say when I was around thirteen or thirteen and a half, um, because I, I didn't have competition anymore, uh, we started looking at okay, what's next? How am I gonna improve? What do I need to do to get to the next level? Um, and the, uh, the head pro in Israel recommended me to go to Texas to, to a coach that he knows to see if he thinks I have the, uh, the talent and if it's worth investing um, to get to the, next, to the next level. So my dad and I, we went to Texas in the summer. I remember it was like 110 degrees. <laughs> um, and we went to see this guy and, uh, and, and get his opinion. And then uh, he... He was impressed. That's what he said, I guess. And then we decided to, okay, let's invest and find a place to go and and try to get to the next level. Okay, so I know we have a few elite athletes on the call, like Harvey Left, but most of us aren't familiar with IMG Academy. Generally described, it's I assume it's a high school that has specialized sports and great training. Yeah, not just high school, some middle school, just a okay. school, a boarding, a sports academy. Um, when I attended the academy, they had five dis different sports. So you go there for sports. If someone just wants academics, that's not the, the right place. Um, so you pick your sport. You either do it in the morning, afternoon, and then school, you know, the opposite. So I did morning golf because I didn't want to get be tired for golf, <laughs> and then afternoon school. And then you have workouts and whatever else you want to do, and then you go and travel to tournaments. And So... The reason why I, we decided to go there is there was a, a guy two years older than me and he was the club champion in Israel and he attended the, the place a year before I did. So obviously the name of the academy was big and it was known. Voliteri started the academy actually in tennis. Uh, but it was more because I, I wasn't going to be there alone and I was going to have someone there with me, um, especially with the language. So yeah, we're, we, you know, parents agreed 
to <laughs> take me there and we gave it you know a try for the first year and you, you see. can't see this but they're still smiling i can see them smiling <laughs> uh so is, is that uh, all year round 12 months or is it just a school year school year and then you go home to israel in the summer uh so travel and play tournaments. i i will go half yeah half the summer um play tournaments either in europe or okay. in the states and I'm going to guess at some point you attract somebody at the Duke golf team. Yes, eventually. Um, so I did okay in high school. Um, and then, you know, the coaches are trying to recruit you. They go to tournaments, look at you, how you play, your potential, your ranking. Um, so, yeah, so schools were my around my junior year, I guess. They started emailing me and watching me. Because because I played other sports, I had a a unique um, not not unique swing, but my the way I hit the ball was a lot more powerful than most girls. So I think that also attracted a lot of coaches because uh, I had the distance, I had the strong compression of the ball, and also the results. I guess. Okay. Before I forget, I, I missed an opportunity to embarrass you, uh, Steve. Can you post that picture of Leticia when she uh, won the club championship? Ah, uh, yeah. At age 12 or 13, whatever it was. 12, 12. So, so we can see her in her bell bottoms and her. Uh, yeah, I know, yeah. Top, top <laughs> there you go. And the jeans. Very stylish <laughs> golf outfit. Yeah, I guess I have to thank my mom. I don't know. I remember her picking my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go back to Duke now. Uh, so Duke expresses some interest in you. There's the Duke golf team where you, you won the NC2A team championship. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so. To be honest, originally, like, I didn't want to go to college, but I wasn't ready mentally. Uh, I needed to mature. My coach was like, okay, just go and try for a few years. And I think it's going to be good for you, competition, practice. And obviously, my parents, you know, wanted the education. So eventually, when I got the offer to go to Duke, um, I took the offer pretty early on, I think, as soon as I could commit. And, yeah, it was a little tough. Uh, from going to a boarding school where it's pretty much not all about golf, but the focus is about golf, to a place where now I have to concentrate on studies. And and a big reason why I got in the school is because of my, my rankings and my golf. So it was hard to have to learn now, okay, to give up uh, practice time and and really concentrate on school. But you guys did well there, right? You win the national championship at least one year, correct? Yeah, so my junior year, we finished second. My senior year, we won. Uh, we won three ACC titles. Um, yeah, it was, we had a good team. A good team towards the, uh, not my first year, we struggled a little bit, but after that, we did, we did pretty well. And I think I read somewhere that you either in the decade had the lowest scoring average or in the top 10 of all time scoring average? Yeah, probably when I was there or when I graduated, maybe it was like top, maybe top 10 uh, scoring. But those like titles, like all American, all of that, I never <laughs> paid attention to them. But I forgot to say, 2011, um, I actually competed. So I went to do from 2010 to 14, 2011. Um, I actually played in my first LPGA event in Canada. Um, it so before that I tried to qualify for the US Open sometimes but never made it. 2011, the Canadian Open, the LPJ was um, hosted at a Jewish club in Montreal, and the head of the Federation Israel was like, "Oh, let's try to get you a sponsored invite because sometimes clubs or sponsors they they have invites for you to like they can pick invites." And it just made sense that if it's a Jewish club, a Jewish area, maybe I can get uh, like a, a place. So we asked and they said, no, they can't do anything about it, but you can try to play a Monday qualifier one round, about 60 players and two people and get a spot. So I gave it a try and then I ended up qualifying and then I ended up making the cut. So that was like a very special um, week of playing in it at my first LPJ event, the first time an Israeli plays an LPJ event, and being played at the Jewish golf club. And I got so much, I mean, the members, the members are really nice to me. 
And that's how I started my connection in Canada. I got invited the following year for an outing. And then I started going there and practicing. I met my coach, one of my coaches. And so that's how my connection in Canada started. So talking about the LPGA and, and your first venture out there, let, let's talk a little bit about, because um, I've seen you out there, uh, and you clearly make it obvious to everybody that's watching you that you're proud to be Jewish. Yeah. Why, do I, why do I say that? Uh, on your hat, you've got uh, your ball marker that's a Jewish star. Uh, on your shoes, you have a Jewish star. On your bag, which is blue and white, you have Israel uh, and a Jewish star. What am I leaving out? I'm, my star david necklace <laughs> um, towel my cough gloves <laughs> and what impressed me as much as anything i'd like you to tell everybody the story i know I'm, I'm going out of order here a little bit but there was a tournament and i can't remember where it was now but i know you sent me a picture where they had the flags of the world on the putting green yeah. uh, except they did not have the flag of israel yeah. and when you showed up the first day you you had it out with someone and made sure yeah that yeah no it's very important for me like representing israel and uh not just israel but I, it, our culture um and obviously i think it has to do with you know holocaust and what my fa oh my family also had to go through so, so i don't know since a very young age when i moved to the u.s it was always important for me to wear the star of david and make sure people know that i'm jewish and if they don't like jewish people then don't like me that's pretty much kind of like my feeling and why I decide to wear all, you know, all the Star of David and the flags. Um, I remember, I'm going to go back a little bit. To, oh yeah, with the flags. Um, yeah, that's another reason, you know, why I want to make sure that our my flag is there too, because a big part of w why I do what I do is to have the flag there um, to kind of show here, here we are, Israel also, you know, as representation and, and, not, nothing really to do about politics, but just like, you know, that we're did you there. Have, did you literally march into the tournament office and say, where's the flag and when's it going to be yeah. out there? Well, every time. Well, I, I think it happened a few times and I don't know why, but a um, few times, yeah. Well, if it's not there, then I make sure it's there because I'm there and I'm from Israel. And uh, yeah, but they were fine. I mean, they, the next day, yeah, they, the flag was there, which was good. And I think it was in San Diego. That one. And, it's, and a story you don't know, but you'll be pleased to know that Harvey Leff, who appears on the screen just below you, was looking on the, the, the box scores one day, and the flag of Israel was not next to your name. And mm -hmm. he called the Golf Channel and okay. gave him a piece of his mind to let him know they needed yeah. you. Good. So, yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Yeah, Okay, so switching back now to the Maccabee games, you had two more competitions, correct? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Would you do that those two times? So I won the second one, the 17, is it? Yeah. Well, the second one was, was it 13? Um, and then the, my, the, the third one, I won as an individual and as a team, which was nice. Um, and again, that was played at your home course? Yeah. The only course? The, now the only course. <laughs> okay. So you graduate Duke and uh, you... Actually, uh, yeah. My senior year, it was a pretty good year. Mm -hmm. Well, my biggest accomplishment is that I graduated and I got my degree in psychology. Not very useful, but at least I got my degree. Um, then we won the NCAA title, which was amazing. And the same year I went to, um, I, did, I started doing my qualifying tournaments for the, to get my LPGA card. Um, we have three stages. I, I made it to the first, the second, um, I, I, well, and the third. But before I, so actually, before I actually got my LPGA card, I qualified for the British Open. Um, so I don't know what month it may, maybe July. I keep forgetting which month it is. But I, I qualified for the British Open. I turned professional right away. I didn't make the cut, but it was a great experience. And then after that, at the end of the year, I got my LPGA card. So that was kind of the end of 2014, uh, um, which was a, a good year. <laughs> Okay, and, and you played uh, and continue to play professionally since that time. Yeah. Um, and you, for some number of years, had uh, a sponsor on tour, uh, mm -hmm. an individual. Uh, and yeah, so I, had, I was representing uh, Turnberry in Miami, the golf club. 
and uh, pretty Jewish <laughs> and okay. a resort. And that's, that's so, yeah. So when I graduated college, I, I was looking for a place to be based off um, because I was in Canada and Canada, obviously in the winter, I couldn't stay there. So I ended up uh, moving to Aventura and then I found the sponsorship and then I'm now here in Miami. So for those of us on the call that are not professionals, Tell us about the glamorous life of a professional golfer and what it's like and the difficulties that you encounter. What's a typical day like, tournaments like, travel, sleeping yeah. arrangements, things like that? Okay, so we play about 23 uh, weeks a year, 23 tournaments. Um, every tournament, I would say it's a week long. We try to get there either on Monday or Tuesday, um, and then we start Thursday. So. Um, Wednesday, Tuesday, we play practice rounds, maybe Monday, um, four day of a tournament, two days, we play, cut, we continue if you are in top 70. And, and then if you finish on Sunday, then you fly either on Sunday night or Monday morning to the next event. Sometimes we play three weeks in a row, four weeks in a row, five. Um, sometimes we do 10. Um, so during the season itself, it's pretty uh, busy, um, a lot of traveling. Um, oh, it's important also to like manage your time. Sometimes the girls skip tournaments, either they don't like the golf course or they need a break. But if you skip a tournament, you also skip an opportunity to um, make money, which is points towards the end, uh, from the money list to keep your card. You have to stay top 100 to keep your card. If not, you have to go back to Q school. Um, so that's pretty much like the season. And um, my Let off season- During the season, um, as, as I understand it, you try to stay with Jewish families, correct? Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. So that's, a, that's nice. Uh, my friends actually, uh, the golfers, they make fun of me because they're like, oh, so you found a Jewish family, right? And I'm like, yes. Um, the LPGA, they also have a program that they can find you a family most of the time as uh, like housing. Um, but I try to do it through either the Jewish community or people I know or you trying to help me find a place in Hawaii or place like that. Um, yes, I try to find people to stay with, um, this way also, also it helps my expenses, but also, uh, I'm not alone. I don't travel with family, um, or other players, but I don't feel alone because I stay with the family every year. And, um, for the most part, like I come back to them the following year. So it's almost like my, you know, made, like my family. So. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. Amazing how people are willing to open their homes to me, to a stranger. And uh, just co I'm comfortable your, right away. Many are kosher homes? No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, so yes, I keep uh, kosher, by the way. Um, no, most of them are not kosher homes. They, uh, yeah, which to me, I'm so used to not eat, like not eating meat anymore. That because of high school and then college, even even though in college I did go a lot to Hillel and Chabad, but uh, you know I try to get my protein through uh, fish and dairy products, and so the meat it doesn't bother me. So yeah, so I don't try. I never really try to find a kosher home. I just, one, to, the one thing we left off in the uh, in the uh, your equipment is we forgot to mention the Callaway has been gracious enough to provide you uh, fairly regularly with wedges that not only have your name on it, but the uh, Star of David as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. They started a few years ago with that. Uh, I didn't ask for it. And then suddenly I got wedges with the Star of David. So that was amazing. <laughs> you try, you try to take them from me. So one day. I tried, but I didn't get anywhere. Uh, by the way, it's, it's not the clubs. I have one of our old sets of clubs I yeah, yeah, play yeah. on the call. <laughs> they don't work. She, so. she took all the good shots out of them. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about the Olympics. So how does that work? Uh, yeah. You're Israeli uh, and you get to go to the Olympics. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, like what? The qualification or just like the experience? Well, how does it work? Is there only one person that can go? Do you have to meet? So, yeah, people, um, they think that every country gets to send someone. But no, we, um, the field is of, consists of 62 players. Um, a country can only have max of two players representing them unless they're in the top 15 world ranking and then a country can have up to four. So once you have already this, if, once you have the 62 players, that's it. Like another, if let's say Israel doesn't have a player or has a player, 
but it's but the field that is already full then they can't send anybody so not every country gets to send someone uh, you still have to be ranked um so you good get enough. so you get selected uh to represent israel in the olympics not selected but i was ranked good enough and then made it to the rankings um and how many israelis competed in uh, sports in golf in golf, uh, in golf? Let's, just like, let's, let's somebody... count. Not kidding. Um, it's just me. I'm, well, I'm like the only, okay. First of all, I'm the only, we had another girl in college from Israel, um, but she didn't continue after college. So um, at the moment, I'm the only uh, professional Israeli. There were, no, there were no men that competed. There were men, but like they were not ranked good enough. So they didn't okay. make it. Um, and how many were in your, uh, your group that went to the Olympics from Israel? I don't know exactly, but it had to be around 50 total, around, plus, min, you know, minus. Um, but I, I always tell people it's almost like a school two semesters. So I didn't know that before um, going to the Olympics, but your team has to obviously has to pay for you to stay there. So they don't want athletes to stay there for two weeks. But no, it's more. I, I don't know how long the Olympics is. Three weeks, maybe? So they don't... So they, they, the well, no, from the opening to the end. Uh, so they don't want athletes to just stay there for no reason. So right. if you start, so if you start like the first week after the opening ceremony, they want you to be there in the beginning and then you leave. And if you are at the end, you're coming later. Um, they were very nice to me. I really wanted to go to the opening ceremony, even though golf was at the end of the Olympics, like pretty much the last event. Um, but I told them, no, please, like, can I be there for the opening ceremony? It's important for me. And they agreed, actually. So I went there from the opening ceremony. Um, and actually, in the middle, when the guys were playing, I went to Sao Paulo. I know a family, a Jewish family. And I stayed with them and practiced while the guys were playing um, their match. And then I went back to Rio. While you were at the Olympics, did you experience any anti-Semitism at all? Uh, yeah. So we had a bad uh, incident. So, so first of all, in... On the LPJ, never really, you know, incidents with being Jewish. I mean, most of the girls are Asians, and actually, I think they 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 love Jews. They think we're, you know, for, for them like we're smart and make money. Um, but so, never really had big issues. Once in a while, I think online, when I few good tournaments, I, I remember seeing some bad comments on social media. But other than that, never felt scared. Never felt in danger. Um, in the Olympics, the op at the opening ceremony, uh, when we're walking to the buses, we were paired in, to be in the bus with uh, the Lebanese team, and they actually didn't let us in. Like the guy is standing in front of the door, um, and then he's like, "You guys are not getting on the bus." And that was kind of like the first time I was like, "Wow, that's that's crazy!" Like in sports, experience, you know, having it, and and I was actually pretty mad and like. I wanted to like flip, flip my finger at them. And then I was like, you know, like you said, that's, it's not going to be smart, like just <laughs> behave. And um, the frustrating part is, so we were waiting outside while everyone were in the buses. So that was like a little bit embarrassing, even though we didn't do anything wrong. We were the ones standing and not knowing what to do. And then um, the people were organizing there. They were like, okay, we're going to split you into like buses. So that was also crazy. And then, so we, I, I went on a bus with, I think it's like a, a country in Africa and, and it's just like crazy. First of all, it's not safe for us because every time we're split, we need to have a security guard with us. Actually, we, are, we were about 50 players in the Olympics for Israel. We had about 40 security people. Oh. Um, that they didn't look like they were guards because they were wearing what we were wearing. Um, but every team had to have someone with them. And so how, many time, rounds, how many rounds did you have in the Olympics? Uh, four um, competitive rounds. And every time someone was with me. And, and as I, I recall, you were somewhat in the middle of the pack? Yeah. So I know one of the highlights was on a par five. I remember watching the highlights on TV. Mm -hmm. You eagled the hole, right? You. So it was actually a par, yeah, it was a par four. Um, it was par four. How long was that second shot? I think around 180, 170, something like that. Yeah, 180. Um, uh, it's funny. And, you, and you hold it out, right? 
Yeah, and I was very excited. Okay, Steve, time, time to embarrass her again. Show that clip of how excited Leticia got when she holed out on the number one handicap hole in the course. Well, there's Actually, your I think I think Justin Rose also. Okay, here, yeah, that's my brother left of me. Oh, and I, oh yeah, so here, before maybe the video, um, I designed my bag. I was very proud of my bag. Again, with all the Star of David that I wear, I really wanted the bag that represents, you know, that really kind of showed off the, my Jewish identity. And um, I, you know, on the sides, I had Israel, you know, one in Hebrew, one in English. And then the pattern is the Star of David pattern. So I was actually happy with how it came out. And then my parents are there, my coach, Federation. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're going to watch the excitement here, folks, when she gets it from 180 yards into the hole, the number one handicap hole. So it's an arrow. The bounces will roll. What you do So that's my coach and federation and is yeah and that's me. Oh, very yeah. Hold on. Thanks. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> At least they didn't make fun of me there. So not like in the in the, in the LPGA. Like... Um okay, so the Olympics are over. Uh you come back and you continue to compete. And tell us uh, what it's like being on tour. How good are the players? How hard is it to win? How hard are the weeks? You know, um, so that, I, followed by, you know, making the cut, playing through the weekend, traveling. Yeah, obviously it's hard. Um, the girls are good. Um, but I think at the end, players, their rookies are just started. They do realize that you, they're not special. Yes, you have to be consistent. Yes, you have to be good. But a lot of the times you think you really need to work hard because they're that good. But And then you like overwork or you, and you're you not as productive. And that's what I did a little bit in the beginning. I was like practicing a lot. Um, but no, like we all, if we, if you get, if you got there on the LPGA, you have the game. It just um, being a little more consistent and uh, handling the pressure. And I think that's where the best players are good at. They're they can handle the pressure. They, they're hitting a little bit more fairways, making a little bit more putts, but, but um, it's not something like, that nobody can do. And I think that's a little bit something that I struggle with that I think it has to be perfect. I think the swing has to be perfect. Um, instead of um, knowing that what I have is good enough and it just like being, you know, a little bit more consist consistent mentally and uh, believing in myself. So that's a little bit, you know, with me, but um, it's, it's tough if you, if you work too hard once you, you're on the road, instead of like doing all the hard work in the beginning, in the off season, practicing for hours. And then when you get to the golf course, be a little bit more relaxed and know that what you did is good enough. But um, yeah, because we travel so much, it's very important for us to have to learn how to manage the time properly and be okay with like relaxing, with uh, taking a day off or afternoon off and and just like mentally um, be strong and ready to go. Because like I said, sometimes we have eight weeks in a row. Um, sometimes the travel, you know, you get somewhere midnight and a new bed. And so, so yeah, it's, it's, it gets a little bit uh, tiring. So I know because I, I, both my wife and I follow you on Instagram, what days off are like, but tell everybody what the off season's like pre-virus. What's, what's a typical day like from getting up, having a good breakfast to how hard you work out and playing, things like that. Mm -hmm. It seems yeah, so, to be all and all physical exercise. Yeah. So I usually try after the season is over in December, um, to go home to Israel, to be with the family for the holidays. Uh, it's important to me. Um, I don't play Yom Kippur, so I try to go home to Israel also. So that's like my break, uh, like two weeks off of the high holidays, I try. And then for Hanukkah, I try for two or three weeks. And then when I get back to the States, like end of December or beginning of January, it's time to get back to practice. And, um, yeah, I, I like to practice early in the morning, uh, work out early in the morning. 
Um, so I'll wake up at 6.30 usually, maybe earlier sometimes. Um, do my workout at 7 and then get pretty much get ready to practice by 8.30. And um, yeah, I try, I try to practice every day and my day off would be like half a day off. Instead of taking a full day off, I prefer to take a you know, half, half day off twice a week, something like that. But yeah, I will practice around four hours of just like swing, chipping, putting, and then go on the course. So it really, it really depends how many times a week I practice. I play versus practice. So it yeah. gets pretty, um, you know, you get long days. But that's what I like doing. And um, But I definitely, I, my struggle sometimes is uh, being able, like, needing to manage my time better instead of being there practice for hours because I can I can go practice for hours but it was always hard for me to like understand that practicing for hours doesn't mean that I'm getting better like I can practice a little bit like shorter time and be as productive so that's something that I, I still now need to learn to be okay with not being there all day even though there might be people that are there all day um, as long as you feel like you did you know you got better today um, just be okay with like finishing with practice and then go home and like do something else. So life is not just about golf. So we've got a couple of questions people have posed. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I practice, so I do, sorry. So I do, sorry, uh, I do workout um, strengthening about four days a week. So I do a little bit more, four to five. I do more than the average player, I think. I'm more into fitness. Um, you play, play any other sports still? I wait, like I do ping pong because that's like, I have it here, but like, I have no, you know, if, if, if some on tour sometimes I do, but if there's nobody around me here that I can go and play a sport, but like you said with you, like if, you know, you tell me, okay, let's play pickleball. I'm like all in. So Did you ever I play love, pickleball? Yeah. I kicked your ass. Don't you remember? 11-0 uh, everybody at <laughs> one. 11-0. <laughs> no, I deny. Uh, Okay, so Lou Shook wants to know about uh, what wants you to reflect on your sudden death playoff in Q school when you got your LPGA card. Oh uh, yeah, that? that's yeah, that's good. Um, so Q school is five days, and um, I was so twenty girls get their card, or five, uh, like five years ago, five uh, twenty girls got their cards. That's the 20, card to play on the LPGA, correct? To have a full status of the LPGA. Then if you finish 21st to 35, you get status, but not great. So I think 18 girls got, no, 17 girls got their full status or 16, 16 got full status. And, and then we were seven girls for like four spots, something like that. So I, I, I wasn't just girls tied for the last spots. So we, um, we were split into two groups and we had to play number 10 and number 18 and um is it 10 and 18 there were three holes maybe it was either two or three holes we had to play and then after those three holes we they eliminated the um the girls who were you know shooting who had the highest scores so we did this we played those three holes and um and we were and i think two girls got eliminated so we were about I forget exactly the number, but I think we were about six for four cards or six for three cards. Um, the first hole I, okay. So after playing those three holes, which was a stroke play, now it's sudden death hole by hole. And um, my first hole I birdied and uh, I knew I got my card. And that was like very, um, like, exciting moment um making the cut and knowing that i think i just got my card actually a funny story is that i played with number 18 ball so i'm very superstitious with numbers so 18 is like a big number for me and so i played with number 18 ball and i also finished tied for 18 so that was like also like a cute uh, story. And that's a follow-up question to that is somebody asked if you have any rituals or or day uh, day of tournament superstitions so is that, is that one of them? Do you play with only? Uh, I don't play with number four, but that's like just because it's a, I think I was told that Asians don't like number four, so I don't do four. I did 18. It's just like not as easy to get 18, but I write high on my, the side of um, 
the number or titleist. I, I write high on the side, so on the ball. Um, sometimes with T's, I have some like, you know, I make sure I have five T's in my pocket. Uh, also, it's a biblical number. Um, and then like usually like if you had a good round, then the next day I'm going to try to have the same breakfast, the same routine. So yes, I'm pretty like, I, th I think it's with most athletes. We have those, uh, how do you keep the same routine if it's going for you? So yeah. A couple of people have asked about, <clears throat> uh, the uh, IDF, um, whether mm -hmm. you've served or intend to serve or have any obligation to serve or where that fits in. No, I didn't serve, uh, for college. They postponed my service. Um, and then with like medical reasons, again, nothing big, but eventually they said that, um, not to serve, but it's a very tricky situation because ever since I was a kid, I, I wanted to serve. I wanted to serve my country is important for me. Um, but once I became a good athlete, um, especially when I was 18, um, for me, I felt that representing Israel in golf and having the flag there and teaching people um, about Israel, about Jew Judaism was going to be more useful than being an athlete in the army, going to the base in the morning and opening some sprinkler heads and then go and practice in the afternoon. So it was a very like tricky uh, situation for me, knowing that people are not going to approve. But again, for me, it was... Um, if I didn't have golf, obviously I was going to do it. Um, I have a twin. She, you know, she was very proud to serve. My brother volunteered to serve because he didn't have to. So, yeah, it's something that maybe some people are not going to understand. But for me, I, I, I felt like it, you know, it was going to be hard for me to serve. Okay. Uh, next question from Jim Berman, who you may recall you and I played with in uh, at Pelican Hill. Great mm -hmm. golfer, former Maccabee athlete. Uh, wants to know if there's any specific LPGA players that you're close to or hang around with. So I had a few years that I was hanging out with um, different players, um, but never made like for like a long term for a few years. So um, no, because again, because I stay with Jewish families and I prefer to go, at, at the end of the day, go back and spend time with them. It is harder for me to make like deeper connections. So it's, uh, I will hang out, have lunch, maybe play with some players, but not like, um, not for long term. And then a follow up to that, uh, Noah wants to know if you're close with three others on the tour that were the first to represent their uh, country. Maria Torres, uh, Tiffany yeah. Chan, and Olafia Kissendoder. <laughs> You met her. Well, uh, I, met, I met her parents. Yeah, nice they're very time. nice. They're very nice. Very nice. And not not close, but like we had like uh, the there was an article about us, and we you know we hang out, uh, to take pictures, and again, I mean, just because they're the first, I mean, at the end of the day, we all have with all the players, you know, something in common about golf. Um, just because they're the only one doesn't know. Okay. Uh, next question: What or who inspired you to become a pro? Golf? Golfer. Yeah, so, that first win at the club. But yeah, I don't. So, as an athlete, I remember, you know, watching tennis once in a while. We golf, the golf channel was not very, I don't know if we had so much golf channel in Israel. It was always a struggle to get the channel. Um, so, we were watching very, like, rarely. So, I don't really think I had a role model, which is weird as a kid. Um, I was always loving like the best team. I remember the soccer, I, I, I was rooting for the best team and tennis for the best players, but never really looked up to someone. And to be honest, I think that's like, because I was always the only girl in Israel and I, I pretty much pushed myself, uh, myself in anything I was doing. Also my parents, I don't know if they agree with me, but they're not as athletic as I am. And I don't remember them ever like my punishment was not going to my tennis lesson. It wasn't, okay, go and run more laps. So it was like me pushing myself um, just because I wanted, you know, I love sport and I just wanted to um, be good at it. And I really, you know, enjoyed it. Next question. What do you believe is the best way to develop golf in Israel? The best way to develop golf. <sighs> It's tough. It's really tough. You know, I tell people that I think the like reason why I am where I am is also part of like, because I'm European also, not just Israeli. Um, 
Israelis have a different, you know, different mentality when it comes to you know, sports, especially with wanting something faster and um, more aggressive. I think Israelis are learning very slowly, though. But they're learning about golf and how you know it's an, you know, it's it's fun, enjoyable. Um, the one big challenge in Israel is that first of all, it's far away. So it's very far from Tel Aviv or from a lot of places, and it's very expensive. Um, people come to Israel uh, to the to the club in Israel and Israelis and they ask okay well, can we rent a court you know like tennis can we rent, or bowling can we rent a court and like no it doesn't work that way so they think they can come and just grab a club and then just hit which I wish it was like that I always I I was thinking I was like oh that would be cool to open a top golf in Israel because people are going to do it if it's not that expensive they, they don't mind just trying because they see it on TV and I'm sure they will like you know love to try and drink and but the fact that we have one course and that you're not just allowed to grab a club and hit balls, that, that that's a big challenge. And, and I think that's why not as many people are playing or not, or, you know, get introduced to the game because you need to pay an amount that Israelis are not used to, even though it's much cheaper than Israel. But then in the States, take a lesson in Israel. I mean, here you can take lessons from $100. You know, $100. In Israel, taking a lesson for 100 I don't know if people, you know, want to do it. So. I think that's the main, the, the one struggle of like how to introduce more people um, to the game. Can and you, obviously opening courses, but that's like so hard. I mean, that's expensive. Well, there's talk of one up in the Galilee. We'll see if that happens. Yeah, and uh, a lot. And uh, yeah, there were a lot. Can you name a few players that you admire either on the LPGA or the PGA? I don't if, admire. I love the golf swing. So I like, I look at golf swings and. Uh, okay, whose golf and, swing do you love? Uh, oh my god, this is swing I uh, I forgot his name. Well, obviously, everyone loves Adam Scott, but I don't know, it's just like different swings. Like, I, I just I like seeing how people make their swing work. Um, so even more, you know, more Norman. So, like, I, I looked and see, um, I don't know, not nobody specific really. But. Okay, here's one from a uh. Uh, someone whose couch you slept on during the Kia Classic, John Aharoni. What <laughs> has been the biggest mental gain in your professional career and where did it come from? What advice would you give long, young Leticia if you could talk to her seven-year-old self? Mental gain. Um, I will say like, stop trying to fix even now. Like stop trying to fix, like you, you're good. Like. Your just swing play. is good enough. Just play, and it's so hard. I don't. Ever since you know, as a kid, I'm. I think I'm a big perfectionist, and um, I just want to get better and better, or swing looking better. And but I eventually, I just. Yeah, I'm, and I'm trying to do it now. I just tell myself, as you said, like you're, you're good. Like your swing is good enough. Everything is good enough. Um, stop trying to fix it and believe in yourself. But uh, it's not easy. Easy to say, but harder to. Do. Okay, the next question comes from someone who kicked my rear one-on-one uh, -on -one basketball, Donna Orinder. Donna, you there? <laughs> I see you. Donna wants to know, as one of very few professional female athletes representing Israel, what is your view of women's sports development in Israel? Yeah, it was always uh, it's tough, it was tough for me again as a kid. Um, there's a story that I will never forget with my parents and my mom would, you know, she, I know I always give her a hard time for that, but I was a pretty good soccer player as a kid. Um, when I was 10, 11, 12, I, I tried, um, I don't know why, but there was a team in my town and I wanted to try the lesson and I went, I think I was 11, maybe 10. And I still remember at the end, they split us in two teams and the score was like, I think three, four, and I scored three goals. So I was good. And I was the only girl. And I told my mom, mom, I want to join the team. I want to, you know, play more soccer. And she's like, no. So that's pretty much like me as a kid, um, being the only one in my town playing soccer or playing tennis. I was playing with boys that are older than me. Um, so it, it was hard for me as a kid. And I come to the States, I went to the boarding school, you have soccer for girls, you have basketball for girls. So I don't know why in Israel we didn't have that. Um, now it's getting better. I remember a few years ago, I went back to 
uh, Cesarea and I learned that they do have a girls team for soccer. Um, so I just, again, I have such a big passion when it comes to sport and um, it's really important for me to know and see that, you know, girls are, are willing to play sports, that they're not afraid to like love, you know, being aggressive on the court. And so that's something that for me, I think in the future, I want to be involved with trying to, um, to show girls that they're, they're okay with playing whatever they want to play, even if they're the only one. Okay. Well, it's been about an hour. Uh, for stars, I want to thank you for taking an hour out of your busy schedule down in Florida to spend it with 60 people, 58 of whom are probably twice your age uh, and have uh, one-tenth of your ability uh, in, on the golf course, but love hearing your stories. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Steve, if it's appropriate, maybe we can, I don't know if you can open everybody's mic up. Wait, anybody... can I say something else? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to thank you and thank, you know, I, I see a lot of other people on uh, that are listening for like helping me, like either, you're, you know, hosting me or like supporting me. Um, but I, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing to see the our community and, and I'm always very thankful and, and lucky and very proud to uh, be Jewish and have, and know that we have such a, a strong community and people that want to help each other. So I want to thank you all. On my behalf, you're welcome.